You are the shepherd and we are your flock, but we admit the times we have tried to take your place and take control ourselves. We admit that we have not always trusted your good news to be good for us. At times, we have pleaded with you to care for us, but we have held back from caring for others and ignored the needs of others. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us in the name of Jesus. Loving Shepherd, teach us by the Holy Spirit to follow you in the days and places and weeks ahead. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Romans 5, 1 through 5, New International Version. Peace and hope. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith and grace, in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope and the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Our gospel reading for today, Matthew 9, 35 through 10, 1. Then Jesus went on about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, and to cure every disease and every sickness. This morning we hear of Jesus teaching and preaching the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and sickness. And as he's walking along, going from town to town doing this, we read that he was deeply moved by the heartache of the people he encountered. And we hear him exclaim that the harvest is plentiful, a harvest of harassed, helpless, and sick folks. O oh Lord, have mercy. It is so much this harassment and heartache that he sees, that he apparently needs some help in order to reach out to this amazing harvest of hardship. And so he invites his disciples to help him. He invites them to cast out demons and heal the sick. Do they have what it takes? Are they successful in this mission? We actually don't know in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew never tells us what happens when the folks go out to heal and cast out. We never hear about them coming back and whether it was hard or easy, whether or not they had what it took. We do know that at the end of Matthew, we are all sent out to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to bring the good news of Jesus Christ into the world, empowered by the Spirit to do amazing, unbelievable, and awesome things. I wonder 
If we have what it takes, I wonder what it takes to do this work of casting out demons and healing the sick. There is an ancient story that I believe can help us understand what it takes. The story goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a man who strayed from his own country into a world known as the Land of Fools. He soon saw a number of people fleeing in terror from a field where they were trying to reap wheat. There is a monster in that field, they exclaimed. And he looked and he saw that it was a watermelon. So he offered to kill the monster for them. And laughing to himself, he went into the field. He cut the melon from its stalk, took a slice, and began to eat it. The people became terrified. They were terrified of him. More terrified than they had been of the melon. And so they drove him away with pitchforks, crying, He will kill us next unless we get rid of him. And so it happens that at another time, another man also strayed into the land of fools. And the same thing started happening to him. The people fleeing from their fields, crying in fear, There is a monster in that field. But instead of offering to help them get rid of the monster, he agreed with them that it must be dangerous. And by tiptoeing away from it with them, he gained their confidence. The man spent a long time with them in their house until he could teach them little by little the basic facts that would enable them not only to lose their fear of melons, but even to cultivate them for themselves. This story clearly illustrates what it takes to go out into the world, to cast out people's fears, their demons, their monsters, to heal them of their terrors and their sickness. The first person who we met in the story laughs at the foolish people's fears, and he creates anger and hatred and more fear with his actions as he cuts and eats the melon. In the people's eyes, he has become the monster. But the person who comes later in the story, instead of ridiculing and calling them names, instead of belittling them and playing the hero, he moves in with them, learns who they are, finds out their names and their fears and the reasons for their fears, and eventually, I can imagine, as, he, as this person lived with them longer and longer, this person unmasked the illusion of having it all together. He began to let those folks see who he truly was. And I believe he began to realize that he was like those other folks, pilgrims on the way, broken and
and in search of healing sinners in need of grace. They gained his trust and he gained their trust. And soon they began to listen to what he had to say to them. And they began to learn not to fear the melon, but to cultivate, to grow, that the melon was something that could bring them life and nourishment. What did the one man have that brought life fulfillment, trust, that the other man who could only kill and bring hate, what did they have, what did the one have that the, the other one didn't have? Compassion. Compassion is an orientation towards suffering. Compassion is bringing our attention and our awareness to recognizing that there is suffering in the world. Compassion helps us feel moved by suffering, and then it, it helps us bring hope for relief from suffering and a readiness to take action to relieve others from suffering. When we do not know other people, it is easy to give them names like fools. When we do not understand other people's monsters, it's easy to dismiss their monster and to blame folks for their monster. We do it when we meet people in poverty and we might say something like uh, they're lazy or they're just um, taking a hand out when we don't know what may have caused or what may be keeping them in poverty. The demons in their head, the systemic problems that keep people in place, the lack of grocery stores, food deserts, the lack of jobs. We don't know until we get to know a person what their monsters are. Sometimes when we meet people and we hear that they ha have a monster, we're quick to want to just cure them and fix them and, and be the hero, be seen as the only one who can help them. And so we take that monster away, but not really. Because we haven't heard them. We haven't gotten to know them. We haven't built a relationship. Our heart hasn't been moved by their heartache. We haven't oriented ourselves to their suffering. We've simply pushed it out of the way and tried to fix it ourselves. Friends, it's really important in our Christian path to accept the gift of compassion that God gives us. As we walk more and more with Christ and allow Christ to work more and more through us, the gift of compassion builds in us. We begin to see the pain of the world, but we also begin to understand another's pain. We begin to walk in solidarity with people and things begin to change.
And so I wonder how we build our compassion. One way to build our compassion is through something called a heart meditation. It is widening the circle of love. It is when we sit and pray for those who we love, those who are close to us. We allow ourselves to be surrounded by their presence. We imagine them sitting with us. And when you're sitting with the people that you love, whether they're physically there or just in your imagination, your heart grows warmer, a smile comes up on your face, and you feel really great. In the heart meditation of widening the circle of love, you are then invited to invite someone you don't love as much into that circle. Walk to the edge of the circle, take their hand, invite them in. It may be somebody who wasn't so nice to you. It may be someone who broke your trust long ago. Invite them in. And so the circle of love grows bigger and bigger and bigger. It is not easy work. Another way of building compassion is to simply pay attention as you go about your day. Be aware of the presence or absence of compassion. Notice when it comes. Perhaps you're standing in the grocery store line. I invite you, instead of looking at your phone and reading the news, I invite you to consider the common humanity of the people who made your grocery tip, trip possible. The people who grew the food, who transported the food, who stocked the shelves, even the cashier who is about to help you. Read her name tag, address him by name. Perhaps, as you're standing there, take a moment of appreciation for each of the folks and even the creatures who have made your trip to the grocery store possible. And notice when you resist being with suffering. Notice when you begin to judge or minimize suffering, saying that it's not significant or, or it doesn't count or your suffering, your personal suffering is nothing compared to someone else's quickly dismissing our own suffering is not allowing ourselves to be emotionally touched by our own or even another's suffering. Be compassionate to yourself. Be gentle and kind to yourself. Do not beat yourself up. This is the way to develop compassion. When you hurt, you hurt. And when you know your own hurts, you can begin to understand the hurts in another. Compassion is a gift given to us by God. God was so moved by the heartbreak of his people that he sent Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us to be compassion alive and moving in the world. For Jesus knows what suffering is. He knows our suffering inside and out. Emmanuel, God with us, went to the cross so that we would know the compassionate heart of God. 
God has poured out God's blessing upon us through the Holy Spirit and has give, gifted us with compassion. God's compassion is our compassion. God's heartbreak is our heartbreak. And we have been sent into the world to do the work of casting out demons, to do the work of healing the sick, proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. But we cannot do that work without compassion. So friends, I invite you today to become a fool among fools. Understand each other's fears, understand each other's monsters, and cast out the demons and healing. Let Christ rise up through you to do the work that needs to be done in this harassed, helpless, and burdened world. We cannot do it alone. We can't even do it with each other. We can only do it through Christ. So let us go out into the world. Be the hands and feet. Be the compassionate ones. We bring love and light and joy to this beautiful and broken world. Amen.
who wait for us to open the door, to admit our faults and to forgive. Give us courage to do the hard acts, to love mightily and give tenderly. Holy Spirit, comfort us. Soften our touch, blend our voices, clarify our minds, and fire up our hearts for the work at hand. O oh Lord, we ask for your guidance in action, word, and thought. Great One, who breathed life into clay, who continues to mold us in your many-colored image, open our hearts wide, crack them open, get our juices flowing for justice and for mercy. Holy mystery, you carry us when we are sorrowful, broken down in deepest grief, and unable to go further. Give us rest. Give us peace that is beyond our ability to find. God with us, tend our wounds, make us whole. We ask for your healing mercies to be poured out upon those whom we lift up to you at this time. Our higher power, you have shaken the foundations of what we thought to be order. You have removed the blindfolds to our unjust acts and collusion. You have upended our sense of control and turned over our tables of normalcy. Help us seek your will and turn to your light to seek your word. And now, as your beloved children, let us pray together the prayer that your beloved Son, Jesus, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to a time of generosity and gratitude. I continue to give thanks for you, for the ways that you are bringing the kingdom of God here on earth. For the ways that you are sharing your gifts your witness, your service, your very selves, so that others can have life and have it abundantly. Thank you. And now I invite you to join with me in our prayer of dedication. Oh Lord, we know that there is much work to be done, far more than we ever imagined. We ask that you bless the gifts that we give, that they may be used for the work you have set before us. For we place our lives and trust in you. Amen. Let us sing together, sent forth by God's blessing.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you, now and